Good evening, and welcome to CB8 Speaks, tonight's program, which is about the vendor situation in Community District 8. And our guest tonight is Michelle Birnbaum, who is the chairperson of the Vendor Task Force Committee, and who is um, continuing, this is the second of two programs, about the vendor issue. Thanks, Michelle, for coming back. Thank you very much for having me, Beth. Well, the, the prior program, we talked a lot about what the issues are, um, and they're vast, yeah. and we just talked for half an hour about that. So um, can you talk to the audience about what are the broad issues that are involved here? Yeah, I'll do that, and, and then I think, and then as we'll probably go to the solutions, because we don't want to just stress all of the concerns. We'd like to say, well, what are we going to do about it? And mm -hmm. actually, that was one of the main reasons for starting for that committee, uh, not just to hear complaints, but also to find solutions, because we're all very good at complaining, but what are we going to do about it? And there are solutions that are fair to both uh, the business, the residents, and the vendors, and that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So what we talked about at our last program were the kinds of vendors. So we've got free speech, we've got veteran, general merchandise, food vendors of varying kinds, trucks, carts, uh, stands, etc. And we talked about some of the issues of compliance and some of the rules and regulations. Um, so with, with reference to that, when we're talking about solutions, for example, we've got some laws on the books. Let's talk about uh, um, the size of a table. So we know we're supposed to have an eight-foot table. We know we're not supposed to be near a hydrant. We know we're suppo not supposed to be less than uh, 20 feet from a building entrance or service entrance. So we know all that. So now we're on the enforcement level. When you're talking about the stuff that is already legislated, there are already rules and regulations and laws on the books. How do you enforce it? Well, you enforce it the same way you do any law in the city. However, one of our big issues and something that uh, we, I certainly have been advocating for many, many, many years now is a separate vendor enforcement enforcement squad. That is a dedicated squad that is fully aware, knowledgeable, and cognizant of all vendor regulation. Now this task now falls on our precinct, and the 19th precinct does a terrific job, their conditions unit, with vendor compliance. However, there's nowhere near the manpower uh, for them to actually be as, as uh, complete in their effort as we would like them to be. South of 59th Street, there is a separate peddler force. We do not have that north of 59th Street, and it's something we've been asking about. So we actually have community board resolutions calling for a separate enforcement squad, and it would be run very similar to the meter people. Uh, they would be mm -hmm. specifically designated to ticketing and making vendors uh, comply with the law. And the hope would be that the revenue source would fund, would fund the enforcement squad. So that would be one solution. Another solution that I've been advocating and actually is in the one of the community board resolutions is standardized street furniture. Now, one of the complaints is that vendors on the street are a visual blight. As you look at each general merchandise vendor, who's someone who's selling scarves or pocketbooks or uh, jewelry or whatever, the tables are, even if they're compliant at eight feet, they're not, they really don't add to the visual appeal of the city. And I think standardized street furniture, where upon getting a license, a vendor would be issued the compliant eight-foot table, and an appropriate cover, the kind of cover that you might see if you went to an art or antique show. You know, a dealer might cover his table to the floor with, um, with one color to be decided by the, you know, the design people of the city, um, a chair or two. Some extra inventory could be hid under the table so it's not all around the vendor and onto the spilling onto the street which is unsightly and looks like litter a good percentage of the time. Standardized signage so that uh, there's an appeal and also so that both the consumer and law enforcement know that they're dealing with a legal vendor. Because if you've got the standardized furniture, then by that very nature, you're licensed and you're legal. Because one of the issues is that there are illegal vendors. To be distinguished from non-compliant vendors, there are vendors who are 
who have licenses, they're legal, they can be there, but they're not following the rules and regulations. So um, we think that that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And also that their license be prominently displayed along with a permit being prominently displayed if it's, if it's a food cart or whatever. And that would take us to the next solution from which we've actually had feedback from the police. And that is that if you have the permit obviously um, in view and the license in view, that a policeman, if he or, or the vendor enforcement squad or whoever, if they were filling out a ticket, they could enter both those numbers and you can see the cross between uh, the vendor operating the, the cart and the permit holder. They're not necessarily the same person. Mm -hmm. That also was in a community board resolution and also for electronic ticketing so that the police and other agencies could get some feedback as to, uh, from law enforcement, as to how the tickets are adjudicated. Are the fines paid? Are they not? Are they accumulated? So far, there's really no feedback. And that was one of the frustrations expressed to us by the police, that they'll do their best to ticket non-compliant or illegal vendors. And in fact, they, never, they don't know what happened to that. They don't know if... if um, if it was thrown out, because sometimes this happens. It can be thrown out because the ticket was written incorrectly or it's thrown out for another reason, or, in fact, a vendor was found guilty, but he's accumulating fines and he hasn't paid. So all this kind of um, uh, vendor enforcement squad dedicated to that, standardized street furniture, f electronic ticketing, feedback for the police, a whole slew of things, um, even licenses, that can't be counterfeited. You know, there are some licenses that can be duplicated. Um, in the, and using some of the technology that credit card companies use so that you can't easily duplicate these. Um, so these are some of the solutions that we've come up with, which is, uh, you know, and they all can be explored. Another one, actually, that's very interesting, we don't, th these are some recommendations we have to explore to see whether or not it's, it's really worth doing. Um, but that, that would be where, um, where a vendor who is, who is operating in a certain area, whether or not he should be there. In other words, if you are a vendor paying the same amount of money for your license, should you be in a high-traffic commercial area and pay the same amount of money as a vendor who doesn't have that spot and he's in a lesser area. Let's say a vendor is on First Avenue and 82nd Street, he's not taking in the amount of money on that day that a vendor is taking in on 86 or on 125th Street near a subway, for example, although you're not supposed to be too close to a subway, but um, entrance. So one of the suggestions was to have graduated uh, licenses. In other words, you pay, you pay a different amount and you're paying for your location. And actually, it could be considered a good business investment. Somebody who doesn't have a lot of money could buy a license for a lesser, a lesser location, a lesser populated location, work his way or her way up and say, OK, I, I did well there and now I'm going to use that money and buy a license, you know, for another location. So all these things um, can be talked about, but there has to be a way to both satisfy the vendor community and yet limit their impact on the quality of life of the residents and the businesses that they serve. Um, we also talked about having assigned locations for trucks, for example. Uh, food truck vendors are popular, but now there's a tremendous proliferation as bricks and mortar businesses are expanding by using trucks. Well, maybe there should be an assigned spot, maybe a, a spot, you know, midtown that says truck vending only, you know, that kind of thing. Being mindful of not to overburden a neighborhood, overburden a street, overburden a location. And there has been legislation introduced here that needs to be tweaked for just those reasons to make sure that, um, you know, that you're, you're accounting for the repercussions of what, you, of what your decision mm -hmm. is. One of my questions, and you kind of touched on that, is what the community board does about this, which is resolutions and having hearings? Yeah, the community yeah. board has been terrific. Number mm -hmm. one, we have our committee, mm -hmm. which permits us outreach to the public. And also, 
the the public that comes to the to the community board either to the meetings or sends their comments complaints or praises or whatever to the district office it has a place to go it's mm -hmm. directed to our to our committee and so we can deal with it on the committee level and what we do in the committee is we take the, those comments very seriously and where appropriate we form resolutions and the resolutions go to the full board for their vote and then from the full board it gets sent down to the city it becomes part of the city record here's a, i just brought a bunch of them i won't read them because okay. we'll bore everybody to death but in some of these resolutions are the standardized street furniture i talked about um, the the set locations for certain vendors the um, the street furniture um, all kinds of things that we have suggested. We have one on the electronic uh, ticketing in order to uh, give the police some feedback. We have um, uh, enforcing the sanitary regulations and increasing the fines uh, with reference to that. And one of the things that was disappointing to us, however, because we think that the fines could have been... Um, uh, made a little more punitive and in fact uh, one effort of the city council they've actually diminished them so we're not too happy about that but we do get other things done uh, the community board resolved and urged stronger more consistent enforcement of existing vendor law with respect to sanitation garbage collection and disposal so the community board is very very active this is the electronic and mm -hmm. um, you know feedback to the police and other law enforcement people as to how a ticket was or a situation was adjudicated. So the community board is extremely helpful, um, and it's a good sounding board for the community. And um, the other thing is it's, it's, it's a place where people can not only voice their opinion, but they can find other like-minded people so that if they wanted to take this further on their own or form a group or whatever, the community board acts as a facilitator for that. And um, that actually is our effort in our May 20th meeting, is to bring a bunch of groups that had attended our past meetings together in a forum situation so that they can then exchange information, join, form groups on their own, and, you know, take this to where it's appropriate for their individual communities or concerns. People who have concerns about this, um, maybe attending this May 20th meeting, and also communicating to the board office, which um, everyone, um, again, uh, we mention this in the show all the time, go to cb8m.com. You can find the meetings there. You can actually find these resolutions posted on, yes. on the website. Mm -hmm. They also have the phone number um, that they can call the board office. They want to talk. but they're, email. they're Or email. Email is probably better mm -hmm. because you'll have your own record of it. Right. You'll know what you've said exactly. You can follow up with a phone call, of right. course. Right. Um, and uh, I was also wondering that in addition to communi commi communicating to the community board office, should people also be calling 311 or health department? Well, that's actually an excellent thought because the truth is if you have a, um, a complaint about a vendor that's non-compliant any kind uh, the truck or or um, uh, say a truck is idling there are idling laws or uh, say you see litter or you see them emptying grease or something in the street if you call 311 or go online mm -hmm. uh, you can actually make that report and in fact it does go to the appropriate agency Great. Uh, the Department of Health would be handling anything that has to do with food Department of Consumer Affairs uh, would handle anything that had to do with um, general merchandise. Now, the Department of Consumer Affairs is not an enforcing agency. They do not send people out and give tickets. Mm -hmm. But um, they will talk to the conditions unit of, the, of your precinct, who can then go out and do that. And mm -hmm. you can also call your precinct and report a violation mm -hmm. or, some, or some intrusive activity that you think is inappropriate mm -hmm. and might be against the law. Sure. Yeah, and that's, uh, I have to say, when I've called the local precinct on concerns, some people may be afraid, because I know years ago they used to be very brusque. The 19th precinct is excellent. Yes, they work very hard. They handle the phones really well. Um, mm -hmm. So they they definitely are another resource Absolutely. for this. Yeah. 
How are the local elected officials handling the concerns about vendors? Well, you know, as I mentioned in our last broadcast, I actually go down to the city council when legislation comes up. I go down to mm -hmm. testify, and so I've had an opportunity to observe the other council members from all over the city and also hear testimony from people all over the city. So council members in general are taking this very seriously because as the kinds of vending changes and increases and uh, as bricks and mortar businesses start to use it more and more to expand their business rather than open another restaurant or another store, they'll send out a truck or um, and you're getting this more and more. It's expanding into all kinds of businesses, dress selling and, you know, everything. Um, but um, as that happens, we try to address it with legislation that is not already on the books. So having been down there to testify, I've observed that this is of concern in almost every community. Our elected officials, uh, Dan Gorodnik and Jessica Lappin, when she was our council member, Dan Gorodnik is still our council member, uh, they've worked very hard on this issue. I have gone to uh, Council Member Gorodnik on any number of occasions. He has been very, very supportive, very helpful, and in fact, uh, had introduced much of the vendor legislation that was brought forward. He had been head of the Consumer Affairs uh, Committee of the City Council. Mm -hmm. So he was very helpful, and Jessica Lappin was very responsive as well. But it, my observation down at the council was that more and more council members are becoming involved because they're reacting to what they're hearing from their constituents. Vendors and uh, bricks and mortar and residents and, you know, restaurants and everybody that might make up a neighborhood. During some of the meetings that I've attended, you have and others have mentioned what's known as the good humor law. Yeah, this Could you is, explain <laughs> what that is? Because it's a very important law despite it's an its important strange law. title. <laughs> it's a strange law. It, it came into effect somewhere around 1943 and apparently has not changed. And what it is, um, there is an argument to be made that it's, in quote, unfair for somebody selling like merchandise to position himself in front of a bricks and mortar store selling that kind of merchandise. So let's say it was an ice cream truck, you might not want the good humor, I mean an ice cream store, you might not want the good humor truck right outside. If you are a fruit store, you might not want the fruit vendor. As a matter of fact, you don't want the fruit vendor right outside, but be because that vendor doesn't have rent and insurance and other compliance issues, by that very nature, he can afford to sell things less expensively, and that makes a big impact on a bricks and mortar business. So the argument was, well, gee, that should not be permitted. That should be against the law. And in fact, it was litigated. And uh, it was ruled that you can't do that. It's sort of, it's a restrict, restraint of trade, it, that it is not legal to say that if you're selling handbags in front of a handbag store that you're not allowed to be there. Now, the city council can't do anything about this because it wasn't a law that they have passed. This was a law that a, a judge had ruled on this. It went to litigation. It went to court. So it's still on the books. But in our committee meetings, we have had businesses um, and alliances of businesses attend our meetings and say that they are going to have their legal representatives look into this. The community board does not get involved with any kind of litigation or legal challenge or anything like that. But certainly this is a major issue, and uh, they may be able to find something uh, to alter it. It's been on the books a long time. You did mention about representatives who have come to the meeting. Um, there have been some pretty disparate types of people who have been there, vendors, business owners. Could you describe some of the other notables who have been there? Well, everybody who's interested in this issue uh, comes to the meeting. So businesses, yeah. residents, etc. Mm -hmm. We ask that the elected officials come or their representatives. We ask that the police come to the meetings. 
uh, Department of Health representatives, sanitation, consumer affairs, because we want their expertise, we want their input, we want their clarification as to what is doable from an enforcement point of view and what is not doable. One of the issues that exists around the city that is quite major is counterfeit merchandise. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a whole other set of legal of legal issues. And as a matter of fact, some parts of the city downtown actually have their own counterfeit unit. There are some places mm -hmm. where in the city where it's more of an issue than it is of others. So we like to have representatives from all of the city agencies at our meetings to the extent that they can attend. We've been very fortunate. Uh, we have our local assembly people uh, representatives, our council members, and of course some are more active than others and for most it's a local issue, but we have been very happy that I have contacts and liaisons with say the Department of Health that if I see an infraction I can call them and in fact they've done sweeps of the area where they'll bring a team with them and actually do a sweep and ticket as they go. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that manpower and time permits we would love those sweeps to happen more and more regularly, but it's not always possible. Mm -hmm. But that's why the last time I spoke about a, uh, as a solution a separate vendor enforcement squad, or maybe mentioned it again in this program, uh, that would go a long way to supplement all of these other concerns because I envision such a squad being able to ticket across agencies so that, for example, the Department of Health, if they saw an infraction on general merchandise, I'm not sure that they could necessarily do anything about it, but, a, but an enforcement squad that was knowledgeable of all vendor regulation, of all kinds of vendors, that's their job, that's what they do, and we have them in sufficient numbers, we could really um, make this a much more uh, neighborhood-friendly situation. Earlier you were talking about the street furniture trying to get that um, standardized. Everyone has been noticing the proliferation of these neon signs. Is there any current regulation on this? To my knowledge at the moment, they are not illegal. Um, we're looking into that. We're not really sure. It may be because nobody's ever seen them before, so we have no regulations on them. But we are getting complaints about them because mm -hmm. residents who live, you know, across the street from from sign that might be all day and all night, you know, mm -hmm. become it becomes very um, disruptive. But it is something that we're talking about. I I've just saw the other night in front of the Met Museum. That's a common place. For them, yeah, yeah, and uh, in other other areas. Yeah. And um, I was actually uh, thinking that. There are so many different types of examples. Can you, can you come up with some of the worst offenses you've seen? And we ha you have some photos we'll show on the screen. Some of the worst that are blatantly noncompliant and really put people at risk is the kind of food that's sold on the street that is home-baked and home-packaged. Somebody bakes some cookies at their house, puts it in a baggie, ties it up and comes and sells it on the street. Uh, there's obviously no, no control there, Department of Health, sanitation, or anything. Um, the same with some candies. You can see some bad candies. One of the big problems with, um, or complaints that we've received um, with the truck vendors is where, they, where the grease goes. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's also risk of the gasoline that powers some of this and, the, and, and where, the, where the extra supply of gasoline would be in a little you know, sort of a, a tank and kept on the truck, and also the idling so that the fumes, they really should be subject to the same standards as any environmental, um, you know, uh, moving vehicle is subject to. Mm -hmm. So that would be something we would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, and those are really the biggest complaints and the odors, the cooking odors. We get that all the time because they are permeating into homes and, and offices. And the areas with the most complaints, I hear a lot about 86th Street, yeah, 80, a lot of 80, 87th yeah. Street. I think there's also issue on that street nearby. Well, on 86, we have vendors up and down that street with um, many between second and third mm -hmm. inventory trucks that stand there 24 hours a day on both the north side and the south side of 86th Street. A long line of vendors on 3rd Avenue between 85 and 86th Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a street where that b building that is near those vendors has been ticketed many times mm -hmm. for the litter caused by those vendors. 
Um, we have proliferation in the area of new kinds of businesses that are happening with trucks, things that you would never have thought you could have before. And, um, for example, um, you know, selling merchandise out of a truck, making it like a, like a shop, like a ladies' dress shop, and then standing an A-frame on the street to advertise that truck. Mm -hmm. It's not legal to stand an A-frame and block the pedestrian way. Mm -hmm. And the pedestrian way is a very big issue when it comes to with vendors. Vendors line the streets, and in the heavily populated and trafficked area, they breach very seriously on the pedestrian way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we are talking about is, is trying to get some kind of a survey on pedestrian traffic and using that as a way to control the vendors that are present in the heavily trafficked area. Now, of course, this is a bit of a conflict because if you were a vendor and you owned a business, you want to be in the most heavily trafficked area, mm -hmm. and yet that's where it poses the most uh, threat. So it's a balance. You know, when you're talking about an issue like this, people make their livelihood as vendors, but they have to live with the com within the community, and, um, and the community has to be comfortable with their presence. And each community may have their own point of view. There's some discussion as to whether or not a community board should make those decisions as to what vendor should be there. There's other hmm. discussions that... Uh, that the cafe laws should govern whether or not a vendor could be on a street, that if a cafe is, a sidewalk cafe is not permitted, a vendor shouldn't be permitted. Um, expanding the number of restricted streets to vending. We already have a bunch, but to expand them, and certainly to eliminate them in residential areas. So there's a lot to talk about, but you have to balance the competing interests here with an aim towards quality of life for everybody. No one group, in my opinion, should be sacrificed for the other group. All are important, all have to live together, and everybody's got to be reasonable here in coming to some kind of um, discussion. And new legislation. We need some new legislation. Mm -hmm. But we've got to have enforcement of the old. And to me, the only way to do that is with a separate squad. Well, we've come to the end of the program already. Okay, that and was fast. I know. So there's the big meeting on May 20th. Yes, all right. are welcome. Yes. All please come. Give me your input. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get uh, talk to the community board. It's uh, info at cb8m.com is mm -hmm. the email address, right? That's right. And you can get information about it, and you're more than welcome. Well, thank you, Michelle, and good thank night, you. everybody. And please come to the community board meeting uh, at cbam.com. It has all the information. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. So that will be a very um, good meeting on May 20th. So oh. it's really, yeah.